time. If you remember, it was quite a varied lecture from many different parts. The first thing we did was that we actually were talking about generalized ECG last time around, uh, but it was just a proof that generalized ECG is uh, revenue maximizing among all Bayesian semi compatible mechanisms. Then we did a speed run of social choice theory. We covered all of social choice theory <clears throat> in, in 40 minutes, or maybe less. And finally, we started talking about implementability and monotonicity. And the question of this part of last class was how can we quickly test a given social choice function to see whether there exists a mechanism that implements it, whether we can bring it to life in our society. And we had a property that said, well, on the one hand, you can use always the revelation principle, which already simplifies your life a lot. But even if you try to apply the revelation principle and see whether the direct revelation mechanism is incentive compatible, you still have a problem that you need to check a, a lot of incentive compatibility conditions. So we're looking for some better conditions that will tell us, well, can we, can we have an easier test of whether a given social choice function is implementable? And the answer was given by the monotonicity conditions. I gave you one monotonicity condition for the Euclidean setting, which said that in Euclidean setting, uh, k of theta is monotone, meaning weakly increasing or weakly decreasing for every player, because in the Euclidean setting k is just a number and we know it. So k is monotone in this sense, if and only if k is implementable in dominant strategies. Domain stretching is incompatible. And we talked a lot about that. So this monotonicity condition is a lot easier to check, obviously, than the troll of incentive compatibility conditions. But Euclidean setting is kind of very restrictive. So I also briefly mentioned, without even stating, that we have two different forms of monotonicity that we can use for quasi-linear setting, where k is no longer just a number. And the problem there is that there one of the conditions is also called weak monotonicity. And I emphasize yet again that you should not confuse it with this kind of monotonicity. And it will be difficult, but I hope that it's doable. So there are the two conditions are weak monotonicity and cyclical monotonicity. For cyclical monotonicity, the statement is the same. So if k of theta is cyclically monotone, then and only then it is implementable in dominant strategies. And that's where we stopped last time around. So today I would like to make another step in that direction and ask what can we say about the general setting without the transfers? What can we do in that setting? So implementability in the general setting is our question for the next 40 minutes. The path that we will take here will at first be pretty much the same that we did previously. So we have a suitable notion of monotonicity for general setting, for social choice rules in general setting. And it goes as follows. Uh, firstly, we'll make some assumptions just for this particular question. So we will assume that our outcome space is finite. So we're choosing between a finite number of alternatives. This is one assumption. And another assumption that we are going to make is about the type spaces for all players. So let us assume that theta i are, well, I guess for all i, are rich enough, meaning are large enough, to contain all possible preferences over x. And by preferences here, I mean ordinal preferences, so rankings. And what this says is that for every player, there is a type that ranks, you know, first alternative above the second, above the third. There is another type 
for the different ranking, there is another type for the different ranking. So there, are, there is a type for every possible ranking of alternatives in X. And this is the assumption that we make. And maybe you can already feel where the wind is blowing here, but we will get there. So now let us define what monotonicity means in the general setting. Outcome function x of theta is monotone. Here it's just monotone without any adjectives. So it is, uh, it will be very confusing with all the other monotonicities. So outcome function x is monotone if for all possible type profiles, pairs of type profiles, to be precise, the following holds. So the statement is a bit logically difficult. So let's try to say what it means. Let's try to see what exactly it means. So it says, take any two type profiles. So a vector of types for every player. If you, your alternative x of theta prime that is prescribed by our outcome function to be chosen under theta prime moves up in the rankings as we move from theta prime to theta double prime, meaning that all players <coughs> prefer it, who preferred it under theta prime also prefer it under type of theta double prime to all the same alternatives that they preferred it to before. Yeah, let me switch points. So let's try to give an example here. Let's say our x is A, B, C. We have three alternatives to choose from. We have two players. And theta prime is such that I will write types as rankings. So I will say player I prefers, player one prefers A to B to C, player two prefers B to, to C to A, for example. I do not actually have an example, so we'll see if, if I can come, come up with it on the spot. And we have another type profile, so a parallel world in which these same two players have completely different preferences. For example, good. And let us assume that under theta prime, for some reason, we really wanted to implement alternative C. So then what monotonicity says is it imposes some restriction on what we will have to choose under theta double prime. So let's try to apply it. We have two type profiles, theta prime and theta double prime. Now we need to find all players who prefer our x of theta prime, c, to something under theta prime and everything they prefer it to. So here, player one prefers C to pretty much nothing. Everything is better than C according to player one. For player two, alternative C is preferred to alternative A, and that's it. So Matista says that if the same preferences occur in this alternative world, with type profile theta double prime, then we should choose the same thing here. So here one preferred C to nothing, so we do not need to check anything. Player two preferred C to A, and player two still prefers C to A in theta double prime. So these hold, meaning that Monotonicity would require that x of theta double prime equals 
C as well. All right, confusion is still there. So let's try it again. We had some preferences, and we said that under these preferences, if you report these types to the mechanism, then the mechanism will select C. What continues to says that if you report a different kind of preferences, that ranks alternative C weakly higher than under theta prime for every player, then you should select the same. So here in theta prime C, C went up in the ranking for player one. Alternative C stayed the same at the same place for player two, above and below the same alternatives. So it became weakly better according to all players, meaning that if we chose it before, we should still choose it under state double prime. But this is monotonicity in the general setting. This is a lesson on how difficult life is once you uh, preclude k from being just a number. So what lengths you have to go to define monotonicity? Okay, so we have mo the monotonicity property. As I promised you, we will make the same statement that we did previously, meaning that our theorem here is that in a general setting with the outcome function x a is dominant strategy incentive compatible, then x is monotone. So theorem says that we can only implement some social choice rule if it, if, if it satisfies this weird property. So instead of checking all possible incentive compatibility conditions for all types, you can just check monotonicity. No guarantee that it's much better, but it is an, an alternative. So you can do this if you want. Now this now is no longer an if and only if result. So monotonicity is necessary for implementability, but not sufficient. So this is the standard result, or the mirror of what we had before. As it turns out, in the general setting, we can make a few extra steps. Because mon this monotonicity ends up being stronger than the other forms of monotonicity from different settings. This result is not per se that interesting because, as I said, the monotonicity property is not super intuitive. But it has some interesting implications. So, definition we will call a social choice function f of theta, or equivalently, an outcome function x of theta, dictatorial. If there exists player i such that for any type profile theta, the chosen alternative maximizes this player's welfare, this player's utility. Arc max over x of ui of x and theta. So let's read the dictatorial, this definition aloud. Social choice function f is called dictatorial if there exists player i such that for any type profile theta, this social choice function prescribes that we choose something that maximizes the utility of this player i. It is similar to dictatorial social choice functions in arrows, arrows here, or dictatorial social preferences. And the next result is pretty much the analog of the arrows theorem. This is the Jabbar Sadratway theorem. A quick question to you to think about while I'm writing all this. Can you recall where you have seen this theorem before? Well, in this course, at least. So, in a general setting, with at least three alternatives if our social choice function covers all the outcomes in x, meaning that there is some type profile for which we select every alternatives in x. Uh, 
then the following statement holds. X is dominant strategy in semi compatible if and only if it is dictatorial. All right, so has anyone come up with an answer to the question? Where have we seen Mark Satterthwaite in this course? Exactly. We have seen Myerson Satterthwaite theorem, which said that in a bilateral trade, there is no good acceptable mechanism efficient, incentive compatible, budget balanced, and individually rational. Good. So this is the second result from Mark that we see here. Yeah, I have stated. So you see, this is, again, the same kind of tragic result as arrow theorem was before. We cannot, in general setting, under a few assumptions, implement anything that is non-dictatorial. And just to give you some insight on how we get this result, where does it come from? I will not prove it explicitly, but to, again, give you the overall broad, very broad strokes. Yeah. As I told you, monotonicity that I just raised, as usual, has some big implications in the general setting. And this is exactly the missing link here. So I will state this as a theorem. And it says that in a general setting, with the same assumptions, so with at least three alternatives, if our social choice function covers the whole outcome space, then the following statement holds. If x is monotone, then X is dictatorial. So, monotonicity implies dictatorship in the general setting. Right. But I do want to tell you something more about this. So, first of all, we have this restriction, which says that for any alternative in X, there should be some type profile in theta which implements this outcome. Not implements, but for which we select this outcome. But this restriction is not particularly strong because the results also hold without it, but in a special way. So even if our social choice rule, if, even if our outcome function does not cover the whole outcome space, then we can just you know, ignore everything that is never selected by the society. So the way theorem extends to that is that you will have dictatorship on this set. So we as a society may continue to argue, again, which is better or worse, killing babies or cloning Hitlers, but given that we as a society will never choose either of these alternatives, it does not really matter whether the preference over those alternatives comes from some given individual or not. Good, so we can kind of dispense with this assumption. The number of alternatives, at least three, is kind of reasonable. And we have assumed that we have only finite number of alternatives. Again, somewhere here. Yeah, here, x is finite. Jibar said that theorem, this one, ex does extend to an infinite number of alternatives. So this is also not really a binding concern. Good, okay, now I have a question to you, or two. Firstly, how does this result differ from the arrows theorem from last time around? They are both saying that dictatorship is the only way. So I would like you, actually that's a good question for discussion, I would like you to take a few minutes and discuss with your neighbor what is the fundamental difference between the two and why do we need two different statements. All right. The 
big difference between the two is they answer very different questions to start with. Arrow's theorem, on the one hand, asks what is the social preference that satisfies certain axioms? Axioms for the aggregation function. Jibar Seventh-Way theorem, on the other hand, asks, well, what is implementable? So again, we do not, we are now no longer aggregating preferences together, but we are trying to learn individual preferences and then implement them according to some given social, social choice function. So in a sense, maybe on the very surface level, you can argue that the axioms that we had last time around, so monotonicity, independence of real alternatives, sorry, it was not monotonicity, it was unanimity last time around, those are kind of related to incentive compatibility. And maybe, just maybe, some social choice functions are only incentive compatible if they satisfy some some nice axiom. In this case, however, this axiom is monotonicity, which is hard to draw a connection uh, for to IAA and unanimity from last time around. Okay, so I just want you to have a good distinction of these two questions. Do not confuse social choice with mechanism design. Another question I have for you is how did we already solve Jibar Sajatwe theorem? We obviously had some social choice rules which were incentive compatible but not dictatorial. How did we do it? Assuming that the theorem is actually true. I have not given you the proof so we cannot be sure. But let's assume it's true. How did we break it? We restricted the preferences. So exactly the same solution that we had in, for Arrow's theorem. Arrow's theorem says that if you can have any possible preferences, then dictatorship is the only way. But as soon as we restricted it to, say, single pick preferences, we suddenly have a pairwise majority voting, as one example. So here, again, we had one assumption that our type spaces are very rich. They admit any possible ranking of alternatives in X. And this is the same kind of very strong assumption that we can relax. And we did relax it. So we assume that everyone's preferences in monotone and transfers whenever we have access to transfers. And so on. Good. So as I said, I have not given you the proof of Jibar Sajatwe theorem or any of the other two. But you can find them in Borger's textbook. I've, already, I've also given you a link to another paper which contains the proofs and some discussion of Jibar Sajatwe theorem. So if you're curious, you're welcome to read that. And just one final note on this, that I should have mentioned earlier, is that here I stated them all in terms of utilities, cardinal preferences, but really the only thing we need here is ordinal preferences. So even if our type only specifies a ranking, but not how much I prefer one alternative over another, all of these three results still hold. So we only need ordinal preferences for these three theorems, but they hold for both. Good. So this concludes then our discussion of implementability and all the different monotonicity rules. Again, the takeaway is there are conditions to test implementability. They are all called monotonicity. So be aware of which setting you are in and which is the right monotonicity rule to use.